Welcome to Fellowship of Faith. My name is Dave Gadini. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. And we are so looking forward to just being able to worship with you for the next 50 minutes or so this morning. We're going to be talking about the afterlife today, what it's like, and all the questions that surround it. Hey, before we go further, big shout outs to all our moms who are watching here today. Happy Mother's Day to you. And listen, if you are watching with your mom right now, I want you to stop everything you're doing. You go over to her. You give mom a big hug. If she's in the next room, you go over to mom in the next room. Right now, do it. Say, Mom, I love you. Give her a big hug. If mom is in the shower, that's okay. You open that shower door. You walk right into there, and you give your mom a big, giant hug and wish her a happy Happy Mother's Day. Hey, if your mom is not watching with you today, I want you to hop on your phone right now and send her a text that says, Mom, I love you. Happy Mother's Day. Or an email or whatever it is that you can send off quick in the moment. If you're on Facebook, maybe Messenger that way as well. Hey, listen. Some of you we know are estranged from your moms. The relationship there isn't good. If I'm speaking to you right now, I want you to take a moment right now just to pray, to say, Lord, you know the relationship between me and mom isn't good, but I pray that you bless her. And I pray that whatever hurt it is that's come between you guys, Lord, that you help her to see it, that you forgive her, that you bring her to repentance, and God, that you show to me where I've done harm in this too. Pray, God, fix this. Reconcile this between us. And finally, if your mom has been called home to the Lord. I want you to pause right now and just pray and say, Lord, thank you for my mom. Thank you for her and everything she's done to me, for me and meant to me. Lord, help me to be the best of what she showed me that life is all about. So a giant happy Mother's Day to all of you in this. Hey, listen. If you're joining us here on Facebook for the first time and you'd like some more information about Fellowship of Faith, make sure to just type in the comments something like new or send me info and we'll get you some on that this week. Make sure to like our page if you haven't already. And as always, if you're not catching us live but you're hoping to catch this after the live stream, you can always hop on our YouTube, YouTube channel, Fellowship of Faith as well, and go ahead and make sure to hit the subscribe button to that there as well, and, uh, you know, all that kind of good stuff to keep you posted on the content that's coming out. We continue to live stream like this as long as our shelter in place is taking in effect, so let's hope that's sooner rather than later, and we're all back here together live really, really soon. Guys, I'm going to hand this over right now to Gwen Johnson, our children's ministry director. She's got a message for you kids this morning in case you're watching. Hi, Rock Kids. It's good to see you this morning. I know last week we talked about when we go out and, and we talk to people about Jesus, that the Holy Spirit works on making them whole again. And I want to talk more about what it means to go out and talk about Jesus, because he told us that we needed to go into the world and tell everyone about how he died on the cross for us and he rose again. But I don't, I don't know about you. I get kind of scared when I think about going and talking to someone 
about what Jesus did. It makes me nervous. And I realized when I read the Bible that I'm not the only one who's nervous and you're not the only one who's nervous either. Actually, Paul talks about how nervous he was, and he was like the best missionary ever. And he says, this is exactly what he says in Corinthians, when I talked with you, I didn't try to prove anything by sounding wise. I simply let God show his power. So we let the Spirit show the power through us because we can't do it on our own. So today I brought an experiment about how the Holy Spirit can flow through us and into somebody else, even though we don't have big words or exactly the right thing to say. We can trust the Spirit. So what I have is some water and a string, and we're going to see if we can get the water from this cup into this cup without it spilling and, and see how the Holy Spirit can flow from us into somebody else. Here we go. The Holy Spirit pours out of us and goes into other people's lives and fills them up. That's the, the most wonderful thing about the Holy Spirit. We're filled with joy. We share our joy of the Spirit with others, and it fills them, fills up their, their lives as well. Children, if you want to try this at home, all you need is two glasses. They don't have to be clear. It's cool to see the water go between them. This is just water with food coloring in it. You can use a string. This is yarn. You can use yarn or any cotton string. Don't use polyester. It doesn't work. And duct tape works really well to get it stuck to the bottom of your glass. This morning, I'd like to talk to you about the afterlife and what it's going to be like. Now, I'm intentionally not using the word heaven. See, the Bible sees a difference between heaven as it exists right now and a new heaven and new earth that's to come. So as I talk about the afterlife today, what I'm talking about is the latter, more than the former. You know, call it what you want. What happens after Judgment Day or the Day of the Lord or when Jesus comes again or the Second Coming? I like how the New Testament scholar N.T. Wright puts this. We're not talking so much about life after death as we are life after life after death. And I think all of us, no matter what we believe, what our religious background happens to be, or what, what our worldview has. I think all of us have questions about the afterlife. And I think for a lot of us, the uncertainty of it all, though, the uncertainty of it all leads us to kind of push the questions away when they start coming up in our minds. And I think it's because it's filled with so much uncertainty that the what-if factor is such an unknown that it scares us. Who knows what's going to happen, we say. Who knows what's going to be like, and what if it isn't good? Or if at best it's just nothing. And so we kind of tuck any thought about the afterlife over there when it starts crashing through our mind, focusing on the now in its place. But for Christians, it's different. Because when we think of the future, it fills us with hope. See, God's promises, they're incredible. God comes promising eternal life and the resurrection of the dead. Man, it raises all kinds of questions. What, what will that be like? I mean, 
how old will I be? You know, you ever think about this kind of stuff? It's like, okay, so if I die, and then when eternal life starts, I'm 46. Am I still 46, or do I come back as like a 20-year-old version of me? What if I'm 80 and I die? Oh my gosh, Lord, please, are you really bringing me back in my 80s? Or, or worse, what if I die and I'm an infant? Am I like eternally, infinity, perpetually like getting my diaper changed? You know what I mean? And unable to talk. And whenever I come back in the afterlife, like will I age? Like will I go from 10 to 20 to 30 to 400 to 500 to 10,000. And with that, what does that look like if I age? Or am I fixed? Am I static? Am I always kind of the same? I heard people asking questions like this, like, will I, will I eat? Will I walk? Will I play? Will I wear clothes? We hope. Maybe the more important questions. Will my loved ones be there? my friends, my family? Will I get to see my wife? I mean, I know that Jesus says that in the age to come, we'll neither be married nor given in marriage. So what does that mean for my relationship with, with her or with him? Will we have something that's better and more intimate than marriage? Or was marriage just something that we enjoyed for a time and now we've gone on to, hey, how are you? I mean, will my dog be there? We most certainly know your cat won't be, but will my dog? It, will, will that be there? And, and like, what will we do all day. I mean, the Bible, Revelation pictures it as like this, this, this great multitude that no one could count surrounding the throne of the Lamb and day and night singing his praises and crying out things like, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That sounds a lot like church to me. Are you telling me that for infinity we're going to be in church? I mean, we can barely tolerate it for an hour a week right now. It sounds, I think, to many of us, hopelessly boring, which raises questions of, so what will I be like? And not so much even my body now, but my personality. Will I be someone who wants to be in church 24 hours a day, singing praises to the Lamb? And what other idiosyncras idiosyncrasies of my personality will exist? My sense of humor, my deviousness, my... my, my teasing nature. What will I be like? We're filled with questions about the afterlife. And you know, I just don't fully know. Make no mistake, the Bible paints a picture of a bright hope. But it doesn't speak into all the questions that we have. Instead, it does something different. It gives us images. I love how the Christian author J.R.R. Tolkien pictures this. He talks about how the gray rain curtain of this world will be rolled back and all will turn to silver glass. And then you see it. White shores and beyond it, a far green country under a swift sunrise. Or I think of the Christian apologist, C.S. Lewis, who talks about it as being something more real. It's more real than what we experience and exist here today. More real as waking is to a dream, or the real is to a shadow. In fact, he calls life as we know it now, the Shadowlands. He'll describe it as coming to the end of the school term and the holidays just beginning. He'll talk about it as, in one sense, the end of a great story where they all lived happily ever after. Yet more, more accurately, 
all of our life now being nothing more than the cover and the title page to a great story that's just beginning, a greater story where each chapter is better than the last. He'll talk about it as a journey where we continually move further up and further in. I think of the prophet Isaiah describing it as is a great feast, a lavish feast filled with the finest of wines for all people with the best of meats and the choicest of wines, a feast where the shroud of death has been removed forever, a feast where all nations can come and he will wipe every tear from their eyes, a place where God will take away their disgrace. I love elsewhere how Isaiah pictures as it is a place where the wolf will lie down with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf, the lion, and the yearling together. And a little child will lead them a place where the bear will feed with the cow and the lion will eat straw like an ox, where the infant will play near the hole of the cobra and put his hand into the viper's nest, a place where they will neither harm nor destroy on God's holy mountain because the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the, the waters cover the sea. I think of the images that unfold from the Bible. Jesus will talk about it as a great party, a wedding feast, a wedding banquet. Not the boring one that you got invited to for your second cousin or friend from work. No, think of your wedding. The best that it could be with the joy of together, with family and friends coming to celebrate you and celebrate with each other and to celebrate something good that's happening in the midst. The revelry, the celebration, the joy, as though this could keep on going with the fullness of the anticipation and hope and hunger and yearning for the consummation that is soon to come. Revelation will picture it like an Eden reborn, but now as a city, a great and wonderful city that's opulent to the sight, a city that dazzles the eye with light and vibrance, a city where the tree of life grows, giving healing to the nations and streams of waters flow, bringing life and goodness to those who surround, producing crops every month of the season. It pictures it as, as a new heaven and new earth where the first heaven and first earth as we know it have passed away where there is no more death or mourning or crying or pain for as it says the old order of things has passed away i think of daniel saying that we will shine like the brightness of the stars the hope of resurrection the hope of life the hope in the presence of god i can only imagine i can only imagine what it will be like I love how the Christian songwriter Bart Miller wrestles with this sense of anticipation and hope of the unknown that is to be better by far. Look at these words from the line in the song, surrounded by your glory. What will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in awe of you be still? Will I stand in your presence or to my knees? Will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to sing at all? I can only imagine. The Bible is filled with hope of an afterlife to come that defies our ability to even come to grasps with just how good, how amazing and personal and powerful with God it will be. But of all these images that the Bible teases out and that Jesus speaks of and the prophets and the apostles play with, there is a chapter in the Bible that's absolutely pivotal when it comes to talking about life after life after death. And it's 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But see, here's the problem. 
It's long. And it's wordy. And it's a bit confusing, too. And in my experience, we as people often just don't have patience for deep explanation of things. You know, maybe that's something that will change in the afterlife. I, I hope that it does. But where it leaves us now is God telling us less about the questions that we have while simultaneously telling us more about things we don't care to ask. Which leaves us with the problem today because how do we then dig into what God wants us to understand about the afterlife when a medium like this, a monologue and apart from each other, just defies the patience that we're willing to bring to what God has to speak today. And so I've been wrestling with this, how to tap and mine the richness and the depth and the beauty and the insight and the direction that this chapter gives. And so I thought what I would do is distill out one thing, leave you with one thing and a corresponding analogy. And it's this. First Corinthians says this, that in the future, at that time, in the afterlife of life after life after death, you and I, we will all be changed. And then the analogy that Paul, the writer of this letter in the New Testament, gives is that of a seed. Let me show you the passage. Coming out of 1 Corinthians 15, it says this. Someone may ask... How are the dead raised? I mean, come on, think about this. What kind of body will they come back with? And I love how Paul answers this. He's like, what are you talking about, man? How foolish. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed. And what he invites us to do is see our life in this world today like a seed like a seed of something greater that is to come. I want to give you a couple of pictures here today. I want to show you an acorn up against an oak tree into which it'll grow. I think I just lost my picture there. I'll let you guys hook it up there. Thank you. Look at this. Think about an acorn or any seed, really, in relation to the shrub or plant or tree to which it will grow. Now, if you've never had biology, if you're not really trained in anatomy or zoology or forestry or, or you're not a gardener or something like that, imagine someone for the first time seeing an acorn and seeing it against a tree. They look completely different. The acorn looks nothing like that. In fact, if you were to go to someone who didn't know better and said, this is that, I mean, they would laugh at you. I mean, the one is small, infinitesimal in comparison. The amount of differences seem to outweigh the similarities 10 to 1. But for those of us who know better, we know that embedded within that acorn, within that seed, is something to which it will grow, something that is similar, even the same. That the material in that acorn is only at the beginning of the glory of which it will be. And Paul turns around and says, that's what it will be. That's what it will be like at the resurrection, both discontinuity and continuity. Difference and similarity. Or being Mother's Day, maybe this is a better way of thinking about it. Think about the difference between a fetus and a full-grown, mature, adult human being. Or even if you don't have the in utero shots, look at a baby picture and look at the difference between your baby and a picture of him or her in her 30s. 
in one sense, they look very little alike. They're very different, but what is here in this beginning form will grow and blossom to a fuller glory of what it is meant to be. And Paul says, that's what it'll be like. And then he points us to Jesus. Because what will it be like? Fundamentally, it will be like him. Paul will write about Jesus as being a first fruits and the firstborn from among the dead. Let me show you this passage out of 1 Corinthians right now. Look at what Paul says when he writes this. Just as we are now like Adam. You know Adam from Genesis, right? The first human made in God's image, made from the dust of the ground, just as we're now like him, the man of the earth. So we will someday be like Christ, the man from heaven. Because when Jesus rose from the dead, it ain't just one dead guy who came back. It is the beginning. The beginning of a movement, of a revolution, of a new age, of something bigger. It is the beginning of life after life after death. Breaking in now as a coming attraction of what the future holds for those who are in him. Which means when we want to know what it's like, we can look to Jesus. What was it like to be Jesus risen from the dead? Oh, how the Bible just teases us with things. Leaving us with images and pictures and suggestions, but just short of spelling it out all the way. I think of Jesus, who was both recognized by his disciples and yet not recognized at the same time, something similar but different. I think about how he walked and talked and ate and how he remembered. He, he, he continued the conversations with his disciples about things he talked with them about before he had died. He was one who continued to laugh to tease, to call out, to teach and remind and encourage and hug and comfort and rebuke and challenge. It suggests to me that his personality was there. He had a body. It was real. It was as real, if not more real, than the body that you and I have today. He went up and had the marks, he had the scars, and he invited his disciples to touch them and feel them, arguably with no pain, suggesting to me that that which Jesus did beforehand for the kingdom of God echoed into eternity with him as a trophy in some kind of way of God honoring the glory that he brought him. And the New Testament says, for you and I, it'll be like that. What will the afterlife, afterlife be like? I don't fully know. But I know this. God says it will be good. Better by far. Filled with the hope and fullness beyond our comprehension of the joy and peace and presence of God and his people. The way he always intended. The way we can barely grasp. Man. I can only imagine.
what my eyes will see when we fail. Listen to these words that the Bible says. Listen. I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. And when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God, he has given us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord God, we come before you, thanking you and praising you 
for the gift of eternal life that you freely give. For every person listening today who is in fear of the future, give them your hope of the life to come. For every person in fear of you today, may we see one not who is evil or hard or cold, but one who is good, with arms wide open to the lowest of us and the least of us and the worst of us, inviting us just to come, Lord, into your arms with acceptance and love and grace. By your Son, may your forgiveness and wonderful goodness shower on us today. Lord, we thank you for the victory. The victory in the future. We praise your name. Amen.
may you join in with the worship and the praise that surrounds the throne of the Lamb day and night where they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive all power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. May the picture, the image of what's to come, may it capture your soul. May it fill you with life. May it give you hope. And may we pray to the Father in heaven who loves us and has prepared a place for each of us in his eternity. May we pray our Father, our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Bring it here on earth. As it is in heaven, God, give us today what we need. Forgive us our sins, and may we forgive those who have sinned against us. Lead us not a temptation. Deliver us from evil, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever. God bless. came to my rescue from the grave I've been raised when I needed a savior to save me Jesus you made a way I was blind but these eyes have been open now I walk in the light every step on this road I will follow Jesus you made a way sing it out you are the way Lost in death, but you love came to find me. Jesus, you are the way. You are the way. You are the way. You're the light shining bright in the darkness. Jesus, you are the way. Is Jesus the only way? You're the light, you're my future, Jesus, you made a way. 